All right, well, thanks, everybody. Um, so my name is Jeff Bigham. I'm from uh, CMU HCII these days. And so for the past few years, uh, my group and I have been designing, building, and then deploying uh, crowd-powered assistive technology. And I'll kind of describe some examples of that so you get a sense of what that means. I tend to yell. <laughs> is that good? Um, so, so our first project in this space was something called VizWiz, and it was actually relatively simple. It was this iPhone application that uh, blind people could use to take a picture, speak a question they'd like to know about the picture, and then get answers back very quickly from the crowd. And in, in the initial version, we used Mechanical Turk. I'll talk about some um, changes to that. Uh, one thing that I think is interesting, one interesting way to view this, is that for a long time, people in, say, the HCI community have used what's called Wizard of Oz to kind of get a sense of what technology is likely to be like if we built it um, without having gone to all the effort to actually build, build that technology just to see. Um, and so the idea of kind of having a wizard behind the curtain powering technology has been around a lot longer than our current conception of crowdsourcing. Um, but what I think crowdsourcing and what the connectivity we have with our mobile devices allows us to do is to take this concept of Wizard of Oz and actually deploy it out so people can use it. And so that's one way of viewing what VizWiz is. It's just a Wizard of Oz uh, technology, but it turns out because of Mechanical Turk, because of the connectivity we have to other kinds of crowds, we can actually deploy this technology and see over the longer term how people are likely to use it. Um, so I, instead of describing more about how this technology works, I wanted to just show this quick video of Justin Romack, who is a uh, blind musician and blogger who just independently created a video uh, of how he uses VizWiz. So I think he's a lot better at describing it than me. So I'll play this. I'm going to do a quick demonstration of VizWiz for the iPhone. It's really for iOS, but I have an iPhone 4. I'm going to show you a couple. VizWiz for the iPhone. It's really for iOS, but I have an iPhone 4. I'm going to show you a couple common household things that I tested VizWiz today with and or tested VizWiz with today. And uh, I just wanted to kind of show you some of the results. I'm pretty impressed. So I've got my thermostat here, and I've set it way down. And I'm going to take a picture here. So uh, place this, move it back a little bit. Take a picture. I'm going to record my question. What does this thermostat say? Um, I have some options as to what sources I'm going to pull uh, the results from. Um, I'm going to select web workers and IQ engines, and so I'm just going to go ahead and send. So it's going to send my question. So web workers will actually pull um, information from human sources. IQ engines, I imagine, pulls it from image databases, somewhat like a, a Google Images. You also have the option to um, pull results from social networks. Um, I think Twitter is the only option here now, but on on the, uh, the website for the application, they talk about uh, Facebook being an option. So let's see, it already has some answers available. The IQ Engines has it labeled as a thermostat, so we knew that. That doesn't do me too much good if I wanted to get a temperature reading. So if we just hold on from here for a couple more seconds. Um, earlier I got a result probably within 45 seconds, so just hang tight here. Um, it did identify the, the temperature earlier. Okay, a web worker said that 75 is on the left and 71 is on the right. They're not sure what the current temperature is, but I can tell you that 71 is what I had it set at and 75 is the current temperature. Is that correct? Yes. All right. So we have two pairs of eyes that said that that's correct. All right, so that's just a, a quick example. Let me turn the mic back on. Um, <coughs> so that's a quick example, which I like for uh, uh, a few reasons. So one of the reasons is uh, you kind of get a sense uh, of the power of crowdsourcing from this, right? So 
Um, in this case, you know, computer vision, in the sense, it may have also been crowdsourced, but IQ engines worked in that it actually identified that this was a thermostat, and yet that didn't kind of get at the subtlety of the person's question. Um, and when the crowdsourced answer did come back, um, it kind of expressed uh, uncertainty, giving a bunch of information. You know, it's, I'm not really sure which one is the temperature, but here's the information. You know, let the user kind of make um, make use of the information as they can. I mean, it's an intelligent person. Why can't they do that? Um, I also like how uh, in the video uh, you kind of got a sense of how he was taking a picture of this thermostat. He moved the, the phone close to the thermostat and then backed it away. That turns out to be a somewhat common strategy um, for doing this. And so I think I think that's like an interesting video for all those reasons. I need to do a quick demonstration uh, of VizWiz. I won't make you watch it again. <laughs> um, so it turns out we actually deployed this and it's been out for a little over two years now. And it's answered more than 60,000 questions by uh, 5,500 um, different users. And so one of the really interesting things and, and one of the reasons why people would do Wizard of Oz studies is to get a sense of what people want this technology for, what they're going to do with it. Um, and so I think that's one of the really interesting things that have come out of this research. I want to show you some uh, examples of questions that have been asked. So these are all questions that were asked by people who agreed to let us um, share them. And uh, this web page here has a thousand such questions, and so I'm going to go through some of them and describe uh, describe them. So uh, this first one says, you know, what medicine is this? Uh, and it's kind of the back of a box that's upside down. Uh, it's kind of partially out of the frame. The really interesting thing is, though, even though it's uh, kind of uh, the picture isn't maybe what you would you would you would want exactly, you can actually figure out. A person can actually figure out by looking at the main ingredient of the back of the box here, what this uh, medicine is. Let's see. Oops. Um, the next one here I have, uh, is there a rash on my baby's head? And it's the top of a baby's head. Uh, what does this part of the sky look like? Um, so uh, this was an early question to come in. Early enough with the release of Viswiz that we were still monitoring the questions and I remember about every five minutes, uh, this particular user asked roughly the same question. What, part, what does this sky look like? What does this part of the sky look like? And we were very worried. We thought, wow, if somebody is going to be just asking these seemingly uh, meaningless questions every five minutes constantly, we were never going to be able to support the service. Um, but after an hour, they actually stopped. And we were also monitoring VizWiz, or uh, monitoring uh, Twitter. And we saw somebody tweet, I just used uh, VizWiz to watch the sunset. And so it did, in fact, happen that the sunset over that hour, and the descriptions gradually went from, you know, the sky is blue to the sky is dark. Um, okay, I'm just curious what the controls are for this machine that's in front of me. I can feel that there are two rows of buttons, so you can tell me what the buttons are from left to right for each row. So this is like a very complicated coffee machine. I think it's one, I know they have these at Microsoft, maybe they have them elsewhere kind of already gets at the limitation of this kind of interaction where you just have a photo and a textual description back. Um, you also notice that there's kind of this credit card here. Uh, we actually get a fair amount of credit cards despite our warnings um, not to send us credit cards. Um, here's a, a woman who is uh, asking you, hi, I would like to know if my colors go together. I know that I have some purples in my shirt. I want to know or make sure that I have the right pouch on my waist. Thanks. Thank you, I guess. Um, so a lot of fashion-related questions. We have this whole um, uh, separate paper looking at how people ask uh, about fashion on BizWiz and maybe want to engage with crowdsourcing um, for fashion-related questions. Uh, let's see. How do I cook this? Uh, it's a, kind of a partial image of the front of a frozen dinner or something. Uh, you can't actually see the instructions. And so what happened is uh, the worker said, I can't see the instructions. So then the person tried again. What are the cooking instructions? Well, I can't see it in this picture either. It's kind of the back of the box now, but you still can't see it. Uh, and then they didn't ask a question, probably getting frustrated. And the user said, you know, can't see anything. It's blurry. Um, and I think that happened again. And then finally, the cooking instructions uh, appear. So again, what are these limitations of this kind of uh, interaction? Even though they were, in the end, successful in finding the cooking instructions, uh, is that you have to take multiple pictures. Uh, and and I'll, I'll get at some of the things, I'll talk briefly about some of the things we're doing to address these kinds of challenges. Um, let's see, skipping through. Uh, so this says, it's a picture of like a, a terminal view of a computer. You know, can you please tell me the progress of the disk scan that's taking place? So we get a lot of questions like this. So it turns out that screen readers are great at uh, making computers accessible, except for when your computer crashes. Uh, and so we get a lot of questions about that. Um, 
Let's see, what does this test say? Uh, this is a pregnancy test. Um, so, so there may in fact be accessible pregnancy tests, I'm not sure. Um, but I know that uh, we have delivered the news at least uh, a couple of times in those ways. And so what I think is really interesting about this look at the kinds of questions people are asking is it's very different in a lot of ways than uh, probably what we see most commonly uh, in, in computer, vi computer vision applications for blind people. Um, you notice that uh, while it, every once in a while it does happen, there's not a lot of straightforward, what color is this, um, you know, what does this text say, that sort of thing. And hopefully PowerPoint isn't bad. Um, all right, so uh, one of the things we had to do to make this work, uh, to make this interactive, was to recruit our crowd quickly. Uh, and so we did a lot of work, basically pre-recruiting workers, either based on a signal when the user opens the application, they're likely to ask a question, um, or uh, based on just keeping workers around. It turns out that you can just keep workers kind of uh, hanging out uh, and alert them when a new question comes in. You can get answers back pretty quickly that way. Uh, in, in fact, you can get answers if you keep workers around in back in less than 30 seconds on average. Um, let's see. Uh, it turns out that uh, the time, I won't go over all the, there's a big chart here of different times, different conditions. Um, turns out the time is very dependent on the kind of question, and in particular, whether that question is answerable from the photo. Uh, so a question like this, what color is this shirt? And it turns out to be someone has put their hand in front of the lens. Workers are very hesitant to answer this. And so you can't forget that in crowdsourcing, it is people behind this. And so they're, uh, they're, they're not always predictable. Um, a lot of this time is actually due to recruitment, which we can get rid of if we keep workers around all the time. Um, let's see, so the same connectivity that allows us to access Mechanical Turk also allows us to access our friends and family on, on social networks and also uh, volunteers. Uh, we had a version of VizWiz that allowed people to ask not only Mechanical Turk, but also Facebook and Twitter. Um, the results is, were roughly that no one wanted to ask their friends on Facebook or Twitter. Um, for concerns about latency, the social costs of, say, bugging people, uh, and then also the anonymity, right? So there's a lot of reasons, even though when you first consider it, wouldn't it be great if my friends who know something about me answered my questions? Um, maybe not all of your friends, uh, because you're worried about uh, how you may be perceived or uh, worried about the um, privacy implications. Uh, I mentioned, I already showed some of these examples of uh, problems we run into, one of which is uh, poorly framed photos, you know, how do I cook this, trying to go uh, over this box um, uh, to try to find these cooking instructions is pretty difficult. Um, one of the, what we've, we've tried to do uh, since VizWiz is build systems that allow users to have a more interactive conversation with the crowd, as opposed to kind of these one-off, here's a question, give me an answer. Um, we started actually with a system that was not meant um, originally to support uh, visually impaired users, but rather to pr provide a kind of Siri-like conversational assistant, uh, where the idea is that you could chat with the crowd and they would chat back um, via, say, an instant messenger type interface. Um, once you start doing this and once you want to make it cheap and reliable with the kinds of crowdsourcing uh, tools we have, um, you want to make it so that people can kind of come and go, so you're not reliant on any one person. Then there's issues of consistency, and so we've added a, the concept of a working memory so that you can actually build up a concept of who it is that you're interacting with, what they like, what you've told them in the past. So there's this uh, working memory um, component to this. Um, here's a conversation which I just think is interesting. It's not in the, it's not in the uh, space of uh, assisting a, a blind user. Uh, it's just a regular conversation you might have with a personal assistant. Uh, the user here says, hi, how are you? Crowd says, I'm good, how about you? Good, I'm on vacation in Los Angeles, hoping you can help me find a good place for lunch tomorrow. Uh, crowd says, what part of LA are you in? Basically, it keeps going on and on, and eventually they find some restaurant recommendations and things like that. Um, a little bit about how this was produced. Uh, every response from the crowd is actually derived from a number of proposals from the crowd. So in this case, uh, even something as simple as, hi, how are you, was actually chosen from a number of different suggestions from the crowd, including, I am fine, but wondering if we can do this more than once, talking about the job that they're doing on Mechanical Turk. Uh, does anyone know if we can? So they're kind of talking to each other. Uh, eventually someone comes along and says, I'm good, how about you? Uh, the crowd votes this through, and this makes it on to the um, user. This whole conversation <laughs> is actually built up in this way. Uh, 
what we've done, and, and we have this recent uh, paper about this, uh, is to, instead of uh, having people talk about just random things, um, we uh, have them have a conversation in the context of a streaming video. So we actually stream a video to multiple uh, crowd workers who can then respond to user questions um, and then the best of those responses get forwarded onto the user. So the idea is that the user could be walking um, along and asking questions about what's in front of them um, and getting back a reliable kind of crowd conversation support um, uh, about those things. Um, very last thing, um, we've also been playing with uh, Google Glass and I think there's a lot of interesting applications and reasons why you might want to have some of these applications put onto glass as opposed to a phone not least of which it frees your hands. Um, and so, just very quickly, you know, it, it actually video, seems pretty natural. In this video, we test open glass with two visually impaired source. users. First, we show question answering, where a user asks a question and receives an answer from Mechanical Turk or Twitter, and the answer is read aloud. Share with, open glass. What is this box in attic? Okay, glass. Share with, open glass. What if it's a can of? Uh, okay, glass. Share with. Open glass. Okay. What is this box? Yeah, so it's forward and then double count. It's a little quiet. It's hard to hear. But they do say it's true. All right, so I think I'm out of time. If you want to see any more of that, this Memento thing is, is um, similar to uh, basic computer vision driven recognition of things as you're walking along. Uh, thank you all. There's a lot of great people who contributed to this work, including these folks and Yu Zhang, my student here. Any questions? So um, these questions and the images that you have and like the answers all paired together, do you plan to like release that as training data or is there some kind of weird copyright thing going on? Because that would be great uh, data for like a knowledge-based AI system because you have the question, you get a series of images, and you have people speaking in complete sentences about them. It's not just tags, so it seems like great training data. Um, I don't know, is there a possibility that that could happen? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, the uh, the restriction we have with with um, our RRB is basically we need to go through and uh, make sure there's no PII in any of these uh, pictures or questions. At which point we can, uh, at least in some limited way, release them. Um, it's interesting. The people I've talked to in computer vision think at first this is really interesting data, and then they think, oh wow, it's actually really hard data to work with. Um, you have these kind of low resolution, often blurry, poorly framed questions that are just of any type, any general question you might want to know. Um, and so, so uh, it's a very hard data set to deal with, I suspect. Although I think one, one thing we would like to do is pull out subsets of, uh, identify subsets within this large space of questions that you could answer automatically and maybe try to uh, start picking off um, you know, the low-hanging fruit as we can. So yeah, so talk to me. If you're interested in, in getting some, some of this data, then I'd be happy to talk more. More questions? So the video is, wait, wait. I'm Christopher Tyler of Smith Cuddlewell. The videos, um, you said if they were going by, but does the uh, crowd have the ability to stop on a good frame? Yeah, so I didn't, I didn't have a lot of time to describe it, but this, that's what this is roughly doing. So um, there's a video view, and then if you click, if the crowd worker clicks, they can stop on a frame. Uh, they can actually keep their history of the frames, too. So if they want to refer back to uh, a prior frame that they've saved, um, then, then they can do that. Uh, it's not clear what the best interface is. It's not clear how often those things are relevant, but this does go back to this idea of memory and maintaining consistency uh, across the interaction. Why is that not a great idea? It seems like it, it, instead of taking images, you had a small, a short video sequences. It would be perfect. Yeah. So I, I think I think well, there's trade-offs, and some of them are more technical, right? So there's lower resolution 
sometimes with the, the video. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think in general it's easier if someone cited can pick out the frame that includes the thing that they're asking the question about. Any more questions? Uh, ben Shaw, IBM Research. I'm just saying I'm kind of intrigued by the voting step in you know, the multiple answers. And the, so who just, again, who is doing the voting? Is it the people who contributed the original answers? It's, we, we currently have it drawn from the same pool. Okay. Um, you're not allowed to vote for your own. Uh, and there's, a, there's an incentive mechanism. Um, I believe we are at the point where it's you know, even a formal you know, mechanism design uh, uh, approach that, that you know, actually formally uh, is, is optimal for you to do the right thing of you know, voting through the proposals that make sense that other people agree with. All right, thank you, Zach.